Hello, and welcome back to the CMCC Mechanochemistry Discussions. I'm Ashley Martini. The goal of the seminar series is to bring the community together through seminars streamed live on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Central, and then made available subsequently to watch on YouTube. If you've missed any of them, we've had a slate of outstanding speakers, and I strongly encourage you to check them out. Again, they're available on YouTube. We also have a great set of speakers upcoming for the remainder of 2021, including today's presentation, and we hope that you'll join us for all of them. Before we get started, a great big thanks to uh, Dr. James Batiste, the director of the CMCC, Jennifer Belsick, the center's administrative coordinator, and Noah, Sergio, and Quintarius, who are uh, students in the CMCC without whom the seminar wouldn't happen. Thank you again for joining us. Please do follow us both on YouTube and Twitter. Note that um, the seminar is being recorded, the webinar is being recorded, but if you have any questions, please feel free to send them to us on Gmail at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com and we will propagate them to the speaker or if you're on YouTube, you can post your questions there and they will be communicated to the speaker. Please note though that we do reserve the right to remove any questions that do not adhere to our values. So without any further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Andrew Rapp. Dr. Rapp is the Blanchard Professor of Chemistry and Professor of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his AB in Chemistry and Physics, summa cum laude at Harvard University in 1986, and his PhD in Physics and Chemistry from MIT in 1992. He was an IBM postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley before starting at Penn in 1994. Dr. Rapp received an NSF Career Award in 97, an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship in 98, a Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Award in 99, was named a Fellow of the American Physical Society in 2006. Dr. Rapp was named the Weston Visiting Professor at the Wiseman Institute of Science in 2014, and the Zhejiang Professor at Shanghai University in 2016. He was awarded the Humboldt Research Award in 2017 and the Cheney Fellowship at the University of Leeds in 2018. Dr. Rapp has published more than 300 peer-reviewed articles, and we are very excited to have him here to present as part of the mechanochemistry discussions. And lastly, a quick note that Dr. Rapp is part of the CMCC, so we are particularly happy to have him here today. Thank you again, Dr. Rapp. We're looking forward to the presentation on developing first principles methods to study force and stress-enabled mechanochemistry. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Ashley Martini and all the members of the CMCC for inviting me to speak at this month's mechanochemistry discussion. I'll be happy to share some insights from first principles calculations and how they can guide and inspire the nexus of mechanical engineering and chemistry. Okay, so I am one of the members of the Center for the Mechanical Control of Chemistry. And so here I show you uh, some of our goals and our vision. Um, we think of pressure and stress as macro scale things affecting objects in the everyday world, but surely they have influence on smaller scales such as interfaces between materials. And then uh, if you shrink down to the nanoscale, you could actually see the intermixing of atoms as this occurs. And then at the atomic scale, we could look at individual chemical reactions. And then we wanna break down to this most fundamental scale and then build all the way back up uh, and deliver insight and understanding of the products of chemical reactions and how they can be controlled by pressure and stress. And I'll be glad to tell you more about the center uh, after the talk. Uh, today, we're going to talk about mechanochemistry and the options it opens up. So in chemistry, we're always looking to take a reactant to go to a product, and one way is through light. We could shine light and you know that photosynthesis converts CO2 and water into sugars. Um, combustion, you can use flames to convert hydrocarbons to CO2. And then uh, electrochemistry, uh, there are various reactions you can drive with voltage. 
we would like to open up another direction that has been explored to some extent, but we'd like to make it more of an everyday uh, useful direction in chemistry of applying pressure and stress and controlling the selectivity for one reaction product over another or enhancing reaction rates or making them more efficient in other ways. Okay, so for example, suppose there's a reaction where the reactant has a certain energy, there's a transition state, and then there's a product. You could imagine a situation where if you apply force through pressure or stress, the entire potential energy surface shifts and you're favoring the product and that could accelerate the rate by lowering the barrier and making it more thermodynamically favorable. Another scenario is let's say that you're in a certain reactant and there are two barriers to different products, but you're gonna wind up going this way because the barrier is lower. If you apply pressure, maybe this barrier could come down and this one could go up and now the favorite pathway is uh, somewhere else and you've enhanced the selectivity. Um, and then there are other ways that applying pressure and stress changes materials in ways that their surfaces become differently reactive. Um, and I'll tell you more about this as we go through the talk. So this is the outline for today. I'm going to begin with an application in nanomechanics and I will talk about uh, stress and catalysis coming together to explain tribopolymer formation. And then I will talk about um, the material design that can be inspired by this understanding and the selection of new materials. And then I, as time permits, I will talk about some interesting pressure induced chemical bonding changes such as the negative piezoelectric effect in certain low dimensional materials and flexoelectric effects enhancing uh, the reorientation of bonds in polar materials. Okay, so first, uh, I think you're probably familiar that as you move two metal contacts together, uh, materials that are at the interface could be induced to react. And so this is a favorable tribopolymer where a long chain hydrocarbon makes a high molecular weight lubricant, and that's a desirable process. In the case I'm going to talk about, tribopolymer formation is actually a deficiency, something we don't want to happen in micro and nano electromechanical systems. Okay, so this is a picture of one of them uh, made by uh, my collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania and Carnegie Mellon University. And there are others that are very interesting um, that uh, materials can be machined at the nanometer scale and then they can be influenced by electric fields and by stress. Um, but this is a cartoon of the idea. Um, perhaps you're familiar with the way most modern transistors work and it's referred to as a MOSFET. You have a source and a drain and then charge can flow in between them and that's controlled by a gate. Um, what my colleagues propose to do is replace this with a mechanical switch where you have a source and a drain and the circuit is open literally because of a physical air gap between this red cantilever and this blue contact. And then as you apply a voltage, this contact will close allowing current to flow. And why is that a good idea? Well, because the MOSFETs tend to be leaky. And as we go to smaller feature sizes, they get more leaky. And so uh, you have some current that flows even in the off state. And then when you start to turn it on, it only rises at a certain rate, which is pretty good, but not great. If you actually could make these nano mechanical systems work, you would have essentially no current jumping through the vacuum. And then when you have a threshold where you've closed the um, contact over here, the current would jump up to its final value. And this would be ideal. This would be great for low voltage computing. Okay, so this is a great dream. And especially there's been so much talk about the uh, leakage uh, power that's now lost because of the very small feature sizes in current computers. But the problem is, oh, this is how these nanomechanical systems work. Let me show you this first. So the idea is that you have these uh, metal struts that are shaped like this, and here's the one, uh, the source lead and the drain lead, but there's an open gap. And then you could apply a voltage and change the shape, and that would uh, close the circuit and then uh, the current would flow and that would be your signal in the computer. And then you could open it up again. Okay, but what our experimental friends are finding is at the nano scale, there's a certain amount of friction involved with closing this contact. And that leads to 
this stuff arriving on the metal surfaces. You can see it here in this uh, electron microscopy image. And uh, this is the behavior of various devices. And so if you have some benzene in your atmosphere, there's the circuit starts with a certain resistance, but then as a function of cycle count, then it's not that many, uh, 100,000 or a million cycles, the resistance behavior becomes very unpredictable because it's starting to have this polymer built. Now you could say, well, just have less pollutants. So you cut down by five orders of magnitude and you can see there's a certain resistance and there's still polymer starting to build up. So that's gonna be bad just in a longer amount of time. Only in ultra pure nitrogen do you have low resistance that persists for a long time. And that's not practical for any device to keep all hydrocarbons out. So this is a really big problem. And uh, my friends have analyzed the um, material a little bit through Raman spectroscopy to say that it's a mixture of sp2 and sp3 hybridized carbon. So some uh, chemicals are building up, um, but they really don't know what it is because there's not enough material to analyze it. So that's where theory can play an interesting role. So we ask ourselves, what is the chemical composition of this tribal polymer? Uh, how does it form during this cycling motion? And how do we use this knowledge to discover new materials? Okay, so I'm gonna cover these topics, starting with benzene, looking at uh, transition metals, and then alternatives for the context to see if they're better. Okay, so let's first compare platinum and gold. So here is our computational paradigm. So we say, let's propose that the reactants that form the tribal polymer are benzene. So you can see the benzene from the side here, and it's in between two metal contacts that are in the process of closing. What we do at each step, we compress the interlayer spacings in the metal, and then we allow the metal, oops, excuse me, we allow the metal to relax, and that compresses the uh, molecules that are trapped in here. And eventually we get to a situation where there's a lot of compression, so much so that the molecules deform and maybe they chemically react. And now I'll show you the next slide where you can see the top, the top row is platinum. And so we apply more and more stress and we show here it is at equilibrium. The benzenes are sort of bonded to the platinum. You can see them making a cup shape. And then when you apply pressure, they get closer together and closer together and closer together. When they get here, there, this one actually loses a hydrogen and this one loses a hydrogen and the two carbons bond. And so it makes a new biphenyl species. Uh, gold is actually very interesting also. It, it starts to compress and the molecules tilt and they tilt more and more and they slide away. And even at 50 GPAs, they don't react. And so we were pretty excited about that, but it turns out that gold is totally impractical for nano electromechanical devices. It's too soft. And you know this if you've ever had gold jewelry, it can't, uh, take the pounding of the tapping of that cantilever. So uh, yes, gold is unreactive, but that also makes it too weak to use. Okay, so then we analyzed for the platinum, how does the stress influence the reactivity and how is there also a catalytic effect? So I said to you that the molecule made a bowl shape. So if you look at it from the side, the carbons bond to the platinum and the hydrogen is pointing up with some angle above 90 degrees. But as you compress it, the hydrogen is driven back down to being almost flat. And that means it makes a stronger bond to the platinum. And then the hydrogen atom can dissociate. And pretty soon after that, the carbon that lost the hydrogen goes to bond to a neighboring uh, phenyl that also lost the hydrogen. And that's how it works. So initially you have your benzenes, there's a reaction barrier and they would actually like to bond. That's the lower energy state. Uh, but if you start to apply stress, you see a linear dependence in the barrier. It starts with a high barrier, which gets lower and lower and lower. And when you get near the point where you think the stress would reduce the barrier to zero, it actually falls off to zero faster. And we ascribe that to a catalytic effect. So most of the behavior is stress favoring the reaction. And then a little bit, the catalysis of the platinum is helping also. So that's how this reaction happens. Okay. so. Uh, my colleagues uh, thought, what about a conductive oxide? And ruthenium oxide is a famous one. So we decided to do the same chemical reaction in the computer using our first principles density functional theory calculations and look at it side by side with the platinum to see if it's better or worse. So ruthenium dioxide is CMOS compatible and it's a conductive oxide. Okay, so the rutheniums are these 
gray spheres and the oxygens are these red spheres. And it turns out the surface oxygen is reactive. So there's three possible surfaces. You could have ruthenium oxide layer with no oxygen on top, with half the sites having an oxygen or with all the sites having an oxygen. So we call that reduced, partially oxidized and fully oxidized. And for a while in this project, we carry through with all three of these possible scenarios and you'll see why. Okay, so first we adsorb benzene and benzene likes to go on the reduced surface and it bonds less strongly on the oxidized surface. You see how it's flat here? This tilt means it's found a preferential site. Okay, and, you, and this is the top view of the benzene on the reduced surface. Okay, and in fact, here's what I'm showing you that the fully oxidized, the chemisorption energy is weak, but it bonds more strongly on the reduced surface. Okay, great. Now we do the same methodology I described before where we compress the bulk of the ruthenium oxide, then we let it relax which transfers the stress onto the molecular system. And we have two different registries. The molecules could be right on top of each other or they could be slanted. So they overlap partially, but not too much. And as we push them together, they come closer together, come closer together. And again, we find a reaction. And then when we pull them apart, look what this one did. It actually pulled some oxygen off of the surface. So that's interesting. And this one, uh, because they were not very much overlap, these did not react. Okay, so again, we get hydrogen transferred to the surface, but in this case, we get oxygen extraction. And I'm gonna show you more about that in the next slide. Okay, so here's a zoom in of this. This is the full overlap case, which gives you the reaction. So there's a hydrogen transfer, and then a carbon-carbon single bond is formed between one ring and the other. But when it pulls away, it takes two oxygens with it. And if you look closely here, this oxygen bridges across the center of what was the benzene ring. And then this oxygen bonds to one carbon. And so this kind of six membered ring with a bridge is referred to as an oxa norborna diene. And so that's an interesting formation of an oxygenated species through this uh, tribochemical reaction. Okay, now we do a side-by-side -side comparison. I already showed you this graph before. This is energy barrier versus stress. And we said there was a stress effect making it linear. And then there was the catalysis effect. Well, here it's a little bit curved, but it's basically linear. And the energy barrier goes down and down and down and down and down. And if there's any catalytic effect, we have to zoom in here to see it. And uh, here, it's only teeny tiny. It would be, um, just a small disruption in the otherwise linear trend. And so it's pretty much just the stress effect. The catalysis does not seem to be very important, but the number I would emphasize to you here is it's all done and the reaction barrier drops to zero by the time you get to 15 gigapascals. Whereas we needed stress up to around 24 gigapascals for the platinum. So we would conclude that ruthenium dioxide is actually somewhat worse, um, but we are undeterred. And uh, so our team, um, including Professor Robert Karpik, who is a member of the CMCC uh, now, uh, suggested that we look at the platinum silicides as a family. So I put the X here because there are multiple combinations of platinum and silicon that are possible. But the one we focused on is platinum three silicide. So I'll just talk to you about that one. And it's a conductive material and it's hard and uh, it exhibits low wear and high thermal stability. And it doesn't oxidize very much, it does a little, um, but let's explore this from the point of view of uh, its ability or disability to foster benzene bimolecular reaction under stress. Okay, so first we say to ourselves, what is the structure of the surface? And it turns out that uh, we calculate the energies of a whole bunch of different surfaces, but the bulk platinum three silicide with the P2S2 surface is the most stable one. And so we look at that, but then we do a second round of surface design and we ask, can oxygen bond to the surface we just identified? And it turns out, yes, uh, for the range of oxygen that we're interested in, it turns out that the partially oxidized pl platinum three silicide surface is favored. There is also a fully oxidized one but that one is higher in energy. And so I won't follow up with this one. We will concentrate on this species down here as the surface that hosts our benzene. Okay, 
So uh, we first check, and by the way, this partially oxidized platinum-free sulcite is still conductive. So it would still be fine for doing the tapping and closing the circuit. And then we do, again, we're applying this methodology now for the third time, compressing the solid and allowing that to transfer stress to the molecules. So again, they tilt, but then under pressure, the tilting is squeezed out. And you can uh, see um, that there is um, some interaction between these molecules. Um, and there is hydrogen transfer to the surface but it requires 55 GPA of stress for that to happen. And eventually we, again, the same reaction happens. So you get this biphenyl intermediate uh, with the carbon-carbon bond following the hydrogen transfer. But our comparison, just to summarize what you've seen, is that the normal stress to make a reaction is 23 GPA for platinum, 15 for ruthenium dioxide, and 55 for platinum-free silicide. So this analysis allows us to understand the uh, chemical reactions that are involved under stress, we would say tribochemistry or mechanochemistry. And then we can do materials design and rate different materials. And we would say that ruthenium dioxide, because it's not flat, it has a corrugated structure, we think that helps it um, foster this reaction, which in this case we don't want. And so we would uh, rate that ruthenium dioxide might be okay, but a platinum silicide looks like a really good candidate. Okay, so um, now I will tell you about uh, one or two other areas where pressure and stress can influence the bonding in materials. And so one of these is analyzing the negative piezoelectric effect in layered copper indium phosphide sulfide. And this work uh, was just published about a month ago. Okay, so uh, reviewing the properties of piezoelectrics, the idea is in this case, I'm focusing on polar piezoelectrics that are also ferroelectric. So if I have a material that's polar, if I pull on it, its dipole should get larger. Or if I apply a positive voltage to it, it should get larger and the polarization get larger. Similarly, if I compress the material, its polarization should get smaller, or if I apply a negative voltage to it. However, uh, these authors have made this uh, beautiful graph here, which shows under pressure, you're compressing the material, some of them, the polarization gets bigger. You see, there's several lines with positive slopes here. So those would be negative piezoelectrics. And that's uh, kind of surprising that that could happen that way. And so we thought we would look at one of them um, that has some interesting chemical bonding properties from other points of view. And I'll tell you about that now. It's copper, indium, phosphide, sulfide. Okay, so you can think of this structure as it has a plane of sulfurs. You can see those are in red here. This is the side view. And there's another plane of sulfurs in yellow. So if it's a sandwich, sulfur makes both the slices of bread, okay? And it makes a triangular lattice of sulfurs and another triangular lattice of sulfurs. Then in between the bread of the sandwich, there's three spots, there's three sites. And one of them is occupied by copper, indium, or a phosphorus dimer. Copper, indium, or a phosphorus dimer. And that repeats, and those are the three species that are shown here. And you can see in the side view, these phosphorus dimers are vertical and the copper is way off center. That's the reason this thing is polar and the indium is only a little bit off center and that doesn't matter that much. Okay, so the interesting property of this is this is a two-dimensional material. It's a three-dimensional crystal, but you can see there's no bonding between one sandwich and the next. Each of them are chemically closed off. So when you compress the material here, this is the ordinary lattice parameter. If you compress it, mostly the gap between layers compresses. The layers themselves hardly compress at all, okay? And what you can see is compressing it makes the polarization go up or expanding the crystal makes the polarization go down. So we can computationally verify that this is a negative piezoelectric, okay? And then we analyze that a little bit more and I'll just tell you a bit, a bit about that. So one thing that we think is very interesting is something that we call the lag of the Wannier center. Okay, that sounds mysterious, but I'll tell you what I mean by this. Oops, suppose you have um, a negative ion and a positive ion. So A is your negative ion. This could be like a chlorine and this could be like a sodium. So you have a bond here, but the electrons are closer to the anion. 
you can see a big peak of charge density here and a small peak of charge density by the positive ion. So of course the electrons are shifted toward the more electronegative species. But if you pull this whole thing apart, it turns out that if you move the A to the left and the B to the right, the center of charge does not follow the anion very effectively. It goes part of the way, but not, it doesn't stay as close as before, it lags behind. So that is the physical slash chemical picture that enables the negative piezoelectric effect. Okay, so uh, the curvature stabilized graphene, I just don't have time to talk about today. And uh, the last topic I'm going to cover with you is asymmetry in mechanical polarization switching. Okay, so uh, my friends uh, look at uh, ferroelectric materials. And so barium titanate is another one of these. I just told you about ferroelectric materials, those with a permanent dipole in each unit cell and barium titanate is one of these. And so this is a mechanics experiment, taking a tip, and pushing down on this ferroelectric material. And the question is, can you change the polarization just by pushing on it? And so that is uh, something that my uh, colleagues and collaborators looked at, and I'll show you the results of that now. Okay, so first let's understand what this graph is showing. Let's just concentrate on panel A. Um, the region that's in red is polarized down. Do you see this X? That means there's like an arrow, but the feathers of the arrow are pointing back towards us. That's what this white X means. And this dot is polarized up, it's polarized towards us. Uh, that means that uh, the tip of the arrow is pointing towards us, okay? So this is P plus polarized up, and this is P minus. Okay, now they take a tip. Uh, so this is that kind of uh, atomic force microscope tip and push it down pretty hard into the surface over here on the left. And then pushing hard, see they're using 1200 nanonewtons, they drag the tip to the right. Then when they get here, they lift it up so it's not touching the surface, they come back to the right. They put the tip down again and they drag to the right. Then they lift up the tip and move back to the left and drag to the right. Do you understand that experiment? And that makes the wall between the up and down domains move. You can see there's some uh, changes here. And then they do the reverse experiment. They put the tip down hard on the P plus domain and they drag it to the left. Then they raise it so it's not doing anything and they bring it back to the right. Then they push hard and they drag it to the left. And look how different the domain wall is. Can you see that as they did this rastering to the left, the domain wall moved way further than it did when they rastered to the right. You might think, who cares which direction you start first, but it makes a huge difference. I think this is quite an interesting experiment. And so we did some modeling in order to examine this. Okay, so my group has developed over the years an interatomic potential so we can model ferroelectric materials using all atom simulations. Here we're reporting results from a 64,000 atom slab model of lead titanate. So this is lead titanium O3. Um, I would say we've done up to 2 million atom calculations. That's the largest we've done. So this is uh, well within our capabilities. And the idea of our simulation is all the atoms are bonded based on their interatomic interactions. And then we're going to push. We're going to simulate the tip by applying forces to some of the atoms in the top layer. And then they will communicate that force to the rest of the material through mechanics. And we'll see what happens. Okay, so we start with the pretty much flat surface, but you can actually see that the up domain, which is green, is a little bit higher than the down domain, which is in purple. Okay, so we're going to start by pushing on the down domain. And you can see, the, this is vacuum up here in white, and this is the top layer. And now that we've pushed, the atoms are actually shrinking down because we're pushing on them. And that the system, when it's totally under no pressure, starts way up here. And this is how far it's compressed already just by pushing with the tip. But no switching has happened yet. This is gentle pressure. And so we have to up it a little bit. We start to push harder. And so now, um, this is a case where we push 
And you can see some of the unit cells have switched, oh, have switched. And so this is enough pressure that we're starting to get mechanically induced switching, uh, reproducing the results from the experiment. Okay, so what is our protocol? We push with some mechanical force. And if some unit cells at the domain wall switch, then we change their surface charges because once it goes from up to down, the passivating surface charge would have to be different. And then we relax the domain structure and then we push again. And so that is the simulation protocol. Okay, so let's start by pushing on the down domain. I showed you that if we push, some of the unit cells will flip. You can see they all flipped except for the top layer. So that one we have to by hand change the surface charge because that's what would happen in real life. New uh, ions from the gas would come and passivate the surface anyway. So we have to do that by hand. And so, so we change the charge and relax and now one layer is switched. And then we push some more and another layer is switched. And once all the units of, it actually happens dynamically. I have movies of this. Uh, I don't have them with me right now. Um, and then we change the charge. And so two unit cells flip with this amount of pressure, but no more. We can wait for a long time and the third unit cell will not flip. It's too far away, okay? Now we start from the positive side and we push and now some of them are flipped underneath the tip. And then we again, change the charge and push again. And then a second layer is switched. And then we change the charge and push again. And a third layer is switched. We change the charge and push again. And so this is a comparison. These are snapshots from that molecular dynamics movie. So this is all done at finite temperature. I could tell you more about the methodology uh, to the extent that you're interested. And so the conclusion, oops, excuse me. The, the conclusion is that the wall moved farther when it was approached from the C plus side consistent with the experimental results. And so we think that when the tip's rastering from the C plus side, it spends more of its time uh, pushing from the C plus side. And so that gives you more domain wall movement. And so that is our um, model of the experiments. So when the tip is on top of the down domain, it can only drive the domain wall motion when the tip is very close to the domain wall and the domain wall moves away from the tip. When the tip is on top of the up domain, it drives the domain wall moving toward the tip, thus effectively increasing the interaction time between the tip and the domain wall. And so this is the citation for that paper here. And um, uh, the final thing I'm going to show you is uh, our CMCC is opening up lots of new directions for ways that um, we can exert mechanical control over chemistry of various systems. And a couple of them are uh, driving structural phase transitions in high pressure materials, and others are inducing reactivity between organic molecules and uh, low dimensional materials like graphene. And so uh, those are sort of coming attractions from the center. And I encourage you to engage with us uh, through these discussions and uh, through various other collaborative venues. And uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge um, Yu Bo Chi, Jing Yang, and Hyung Suk Kim uh, for the first part of the presentation and uh, Shi Lu, Hai Dong Lu, Ziyu Ye, Shitaro Yasui, Hiroshi Funakubo, and Alexi Gruverman for the last part of the presentation. And then Frank Streller, Cheng Ho O, oh, James Best, and Fan Yang for the middle portion. And uh, Robert Karpik, David Srolovitz, Martin DeBoer, and Gianluca Piazza for pretty much everything I said today. All the tribal chemistry was a big collaboration between all of us. And I'd like to thank the NSF CCI program for uh, funding the CMCC that uh, we're all meeting in today. And I'd also like to thank the Department of Energy and the Office of Naval Research. And uh, with that, I have come to the end of my prepared remarks, but I'll certainly be very happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Rapp, for that presentation. We have a few questions. First, do you ever check for hydroxyl terminations on these surfaces? They are dominant over oxygen terminations in many systems. Uh, yes, we have studied the terminations of ferroelectrics extensively. And uh, I actually have an entire other presentation about uh, the formation of hydroxyls on surfaces. That is the correct termination. Um, for the classical molecular dynamics, as long as we get the charge right, uh, it doesn't matter 
uh, what the chemical termination is for the mechanical switching that I showed you at the end. Um, and so I believe that those simulations would be accurate and we include the hydroxyls implicitly simply by the modification of the surface charge. For the earlier part, where we talk about the oxidized ruthenium dioxide, uh, that's an interesting point. But what I would respond is that the benzene carries away some oxygen the first time it reacts and it contributes some hydrogen. So we effectively were including the presence of hydrogen and oxygen on the surface, even in that simulation. But I think more could be done to dynamically have reservoirs of all kinds of molecules. And water would be the next one we should add uh, to make the modeling more realistic. So I think it's a, it's a very valid point. I would say there's an extent to which our results should be robust when we include water explicitly, but it's a great direction to uh, consider pursuing. All right, another question is, you showed that compression drives these reactions. Did you test or do you think that tension, perhaps due to adhesion, would cause a similar effect? And what about shear? Um, I think some of the other speakers in this series have talked about the role of tension in breaking bonds in polymers. And that's certainly uh, an important issue. Um, I don't know if we could apply enough tension to break a benzene. Um, so that's something I'd have to think about further. I think there might be weak bonds where tension could potentially open them up. So imagine if you had a, a peroxide, which likes to break into two peroxo radicals anyway, I wonder if tension could enhance the rate of a process like that. That seems possible. Um, and then as far as shear, yeah, that's something where this center will be absolutely vital because you could see we were lining them up and pushing absolutely perpendicularly. Um, but uh, Professor Martini, who is our um, master of ceremonies for this uh, set of uh, lectures, um, uh, enables us to go to larger scale systems and we will include some of the quantum mechanical chemical accuracy where the molecules approach each other from all different orientations and shear could bias which orientations uh, are favorable. And we think those are handles that we understand in only a quite limited way right now. So we're excited about that. And some members of our team experimentally are gearing up to be able to uh, apply shear preferentially versus applying um, compression. And so I think that's, Mm, mostly unknown right now. There may be some uh, preliminary results, but uh, there's a lot more that can be done in terms of looking at shear. All right, let me uh, cherry pick one or two more quick questions. Uh, what, what or is there a physical meaning of the nonlinear relationship between energy barrier and stress? Uh, yes, I was referring to that as a catalytic effect. Um, I mean, it comes out from the quantum mechanical simulation, so we believe it's really right. I think I would say that maybe the barrier to one pathway changes linearly, but as it becomes competitive with another pathway, uh, the system can switch pathways, and that's where the net lowest barrier looks like it's behaving in a nonlinear fashion. I think that's um, an explanation for the observed nonlinear barrier behavior. It's basically a new reactive channel opening up. All right, thank you. Let's just do one more on the related to the last part of your talk. The, uh, the simulations are indeed quite, quite large, um, but we noticed it was two dimensional. Do you think it's possible that there could be other effects if the third dimension was included in the model? Oh, it's not two dimensional. Yeah, we're only showing two dimensions because um, we, uh, yeah. Um, sorry, 
Uh, 64,000 unit cells means 40 by 40 by 40. I should have been clearer about that. That was a three-dimensional simulation, but I just showed you the front face because you could see the domain wall marching past you, but it was uh, deep. And so it had a chance to experience the third dimension. Um, yeah, that's, that's the way we generally do these simulations. Great. All right, well, thank you again, Dr. Rapp, for that uh, excellent presentation. We very much appreciate you being part of the seminar series and of course, part of the center. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Rapp, for that outstanding presentation. And thank you so much for joining us. Again, a reminder that there are quite a few previous speakers, uh, all of which are available on YouTube on our channel. And we look forward to you joining us for the remaining speakers for 2021. Note that we will be skipping August for the IUPAC, but we'll see you again in September. Thank you again. <laughs>